Turn, uh, turn with me in your Bible, say if you would, to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel 28. I um, want to just emphasize one of the announcements. The, uh, the uh, social on Wednesday night, kind of for young adults, and that, may, that, that young is kind of shifting a little bit each year. <laughs> it's a little bit further up there, but uh, if you feel like you're in that category, please come. Uh, that's a social time. Those of you who will be participating in the Bible study throughout the year, we will have books available, but you don't have to be committing to that to join for the social. So we hope that you will come and we can have a great time uh, together. We, we being, Patty and I get to come because I teach. So uh, we try to leave early enough that you can have a lot of fun after we leave, but we will uh, we'll be there and looking forward to it. <clears throat> um, reading, reading from... Uh, you stay in Ezekiel 28, but I'm reading for the moment from uh, Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 46. An argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him by their side and said to them, whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you is the one who is great. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word. And as we examine it this morning, we ask as always that you will please be our teacher. Take the thoughts and um, ideas, Father, that you've brought to my mind as I've studied and turned them into something really useful. We realize we're always dependent on you to be the one who does the teaching, who does the real work. We offer you our, our work, Father, our preparation, whether it's in teaching children, whether it's in providing fellowship, uh, food. Lord, we offer you our work as a gift to you, but we realize that the eternal value is added by you. And so we pray for that this morning. We also pray, we pray, Father, for our Uh, uh, people who are gone on the honor flight uh, this week. We pray that you will be with Stan as he leads that. We thank you for the wonderful ministry that you've given Stan and Sicily there to honor those who have been, uh, Lord, in the front lines protecting the freedoms that we enjoy. And we just ask that you will give them safety, give them uh, inspiration in the travel and in the things that they will see and bring them back safely. Lord, it also reminds us how precious our freedoms are. Hearing again just yesterday of more more incidents that are being fueled by this this Islamic State group and um, Lord, the horrendous horrendous things that are happening under their name. We we just ask that you will provide protection, that you will provide... um, Lord, that you, that you will honor those who are in such danger, and that you will work out your purposes through all this. And Lord, our prayer is that you will put a quick stop to, this, to these kinds of activities in our world. Um, thank you that even in the midst of all of that, we know that you are in control of all things. We praise you for that. We ask for your special protection and guidance and strength, Lord, to those who are suffering in that way. Bless again our time together. Remind us how precious it is. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. chose to come to our congregation and just zap any one sin out of existence, which one do you think he would choose? Maybe, maybe discouragement, right? That great destroyer of hope, great weapon of Satan. Maybe gossip, that great destroyer of lives. Perhaps the grudges that we hold, the Withholding of forgiveness, a great destroyer of relationships. Clearly, again, one of Satan's great weapons. Would it be one of those? 
well, I'm not God. So I can't claim to know what sin God might predict if he was just going to take one away. But I do have a suspicion. I suspect that it would be the first sin of all. First in terms of chronology, as far as we know, and first in terms of prominence in Scripture. This first sin has relevance to the passage I read this morning in the book of Luke, and we'll come back and deal with it in that context next week, but this is such an important subject that I wanted to give some background on that, kind of introductory background today, apart from the book of Luke, to give us a foundation with regard to this. So we want to look at the first sin, the first sin. What is the first sin, the identity of the first sin? Well, we can ask ourselves, where did sin originate, right? And the answer for many of us might be in the Garden of Eden. And among human beings, that would be the correct answer, right? But we have to remember that there was a tempter in the Garden of Eden who was causing the sin on the part of the human beings who were there, who had already fallen into sin, right? He is, the first of all sin, as far as we know, is revealed in chapter 28 of Ezekiel. That's why I've had you turn there this morning. In the 28th chapter of Ezekiel, God pulls back the, <clears throat> the curtain of time and the physical universe, as he does occasionally in the Bible, to give us a glimpse into things that we could not know any other way. And he gives us some keen insight into the origin of sin in this passage of Scripture. This chapter was written around 600 years B.C. It's a prophecy against someone who is called the Prince of Tyre. Tyre was a city on the Mediterranean coast, north east, uh, northwest of Palestine, and it was a, a symbol of evil in the Old Testament because of all the evil things that happened there. And in chapters 26 through 28 of Ezekiel, there are a lot of prophecies against that city that actually came true later on through the instrument of some of the greatest people in history. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had fulfilled part of those prophecies when he came along a little later, and then Alexander the Great, even later, fulfilled the end of those prophecies. But we have a specific one against the prince of Tyre, the ruler of that city in chapter 28 of Ezekiel. But then in verse 11, in verse 11, God moves to the power behind the throne to, to, to show us a scene that involves one of the greatest, if not the greatest, of his angelic creations. The Bible often does this, moving from talking to one person to the power behind that person, sometimes with very little introduction as it does here. But clearly the words that follow in Ezekiel 28, 11 could not refer to a mere human being. In, chapter, in, in, in verse 11, he says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, raise a lamentation over the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord, You were perfect. You were perfect. Uh, you are a signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. So he's describing here a being, the angelic being who was behind, the power behind the throne in Tyre, who was perfect, he says, in his wisdom and in his perfection. But something happens. And so when we get down to verse 15, we read this, you were blameless in your ways from the day that you were created until, until unrighteousness was found in you. And there it is, the first sin. It's found in the heart of this great angel, this great creation of God. He had abused his God-given ability to choose by choosing against God. He chose Rebellion. And so we have the introduction of evil into the universe right here at this point. Now to get a little more understanding what the nature of the sin is, go down to verse 17. It says, your heart 
was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor, and I cast you to the ground. This angelic being enamored of his own beauty and splendor became, came to think of himself as at least the equal of God, if not the better, and pride entered the universe. Pride is at the heart of this sin. Pride is at the heart of all sin. Pride is nothing less than what this creature does here in setting himself up in opposition to God. At its root, that's what pride is. It assumes that we are smarter, that we are more sophisticated, that we somehow know more about ourselves than God does, and that his commands are not something we have to obey in full. If we like them, we'll obey them. If we don't, we won't. Pride is a killer. If you want to hear where it took this being, Isaiah 14 is the other place where God talks about this first of all sins. And in Isaiah 14, verse 13, God says to this creature who he calls Lucifer there, son of the morning, stressing his beauty, says, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. Stars there being a reference to angels as they are often called in the Old Testament. Above the stars of God, in other words, I'm going to be the preeminent one. Above the stars of God, I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mountain of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. And so that creature that we know of as Satan, as the devil, sets out to be his own God. And when God rejects him, he sets out to take as many others as he can with him. And that's the background to where we find him suddenly in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3 in the passage that Jesse read for us this morning, tempting Eve. And you remember the nature of the temptation. Genesis 3 verse 5, for God knows that when you eat of the tree, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. What's the temptation? To be your own God. To establish yourself in a pride that says, I don't need God. Pride is therefore, beloved, at the core of all human rebellion. It started with Satan. It always leads towards self and away from God. We're nothing, when we are acting this way, we're nothing but mimics of the devil. And we will suffer the same destruction that he does if this is not something that we give to Christ to forgive. And so this first sin is alive and it's well in our world and it's alive in us, even, as, even us as, a, as believers. Sin of pride. Now about the first sin defined. Let's take a closer look at what it really is. What exactly is pride? A dictionary definition goes something like this. It says pride is a reasonable or justifiable self-respect. Obviously, that doesn't sound bad, right? And it wouldn't be bad. In fact, we use the term pride in that sense, right? When we speak of someone who takes pride in his work or someone who takes pride in his appearance or something else, as long as that's not been made into an idol, that can be a good thing. It's kind of the ambition that's built into us to do well, to do excellently. It's not the pride that's sinful, but there's another dictionary definition. It says it is sometimes inordinate self-esteem. Inordinate self-esteem, meaning undeserved. And we're sort of getting closer to it at that point, right? It's an undeserved, it's an unearned, it's, a, it's an unrealistic view of myself and who I am. But the Bible actually takes it a step further. The Bible looks at pride as being esteeming myself anything apart from God. Esteeming myself to be anything apart from God. It's, it is inordinate self-esteem, but not primarily because I've overestimated my own abilities or skills or whatever, but because I see myself as being worthwhile, significant, having meaning apart from the God who created me. 
That's pride. Now, we all need self-esteem, right? We know that. Our society has put in, speaking of inordinate, an inordinate amount of, 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 of emphasis on that these days, but we know that it's not healthy to deal with pride by thinking of myself as nothing. When I understand that I really am nothing apart from Christ, but that in Christ I'm a certified, bona fide, loved, honored and respected child of God, it puts this whole issue in its proper perspective. I have to see myself as I am in Christ, not as I am apart from God. Apart from God, I'm just playing God. And when I do that, beloved, I have taken meaning out of my life and meaning out of my ability to relate to the one who made me in the first place. This happens to some of God's best people. Let me just give you one example. Turn back to the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 20. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, fourth book in the Bible. It's the account of Moses and all the adventures that he had leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. And he had about two million people near Mount Sinai on the Sinai Peninsula with no water available as, Genesis, as, New, as Numbers 20 opens up. So God instructs him in Numbers 20, verse eight, if you look at it, he says, take the staff and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron, your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. Now, some of you will remember that on a previous occasion when they were without water and the same issue had Arisen, Moses was instructed to strike the water, to, to, to strike the rock to bring forth water, which he did. But this time God says, talk to the rock. But Moses is angry. He's mad at these people. He is put out with the way they have complained in a very ugly and ungrateful way to indicate the need that they had for water. And so in verse 10, it says, then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice, and water came out abundantly. And the congregation drank in their livestock. So what happens here is that despite Moses' disobedience, God gives water. But some of you will also remember from your study of this passage that Moses paid dearly for this particular sin, right? By not being allowed to lead the children of Israel into the promised land when the time came. Instead, God told him, you can't go because you've sinned here. He provided another leader named Joshua who led the people into the land. But why did he do that? Well, look at Moses' comment. Shall we bring water? Who was bringing water out of a rock? Was that Moses? Of course not. He could no more bring, Moses, bring water out of a rock than you or I could bring water out of a rock. But he was taking credit, do you see? He was taking to himself the glory that belongs to God. And God says, I'm not going to put up with that. Moses, you're not going to be able to go into the land because of this. You're playing God. God is giving us, you see, insight and what it means to take his part and to play God and to think that we're better somehow, that we know more, that we're ahead of God. So how about the first sin condemned? The first sin condemned. How, how is God gonna react to this you know, sin that declares independence from him? Well, how would you react? God says in Isaiah 42, verse 8, Isaiah 42, verse 8, he says, I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory I give to no other. And he repeats that same basic challenge in Isaiah 48, verse 11. He says, nobody is going to be allowed to touch my glory. Would you share your glory and you created everything that is in the whole universe? Of course not. Glory belongs to God, and nothing takes glory away from God more than what? Pride.
pride, declaring myself independent of God and making myself out to be my own God. Did you know, did you know that pride is number one on God's hit list? Did you know that? Turn me to Proverbs 6. If you're still in numbers somewhere there, just go forward past Psalms to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs 6 and beginning in verse 16. There are six things that the Lord hates. Six things. And then Solomon says, well, okay, seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes. A lying tongue. And hands hands that shed innocent Blood, haughty eyes, number one on the list, pride. I hope you'll notice it comes even before lying and it becomes before murder. It comes before everything. Pride is at the root of everything and it's number one on God's hit list. Arrogance, playing God. There's a telling example. Turn with me to 2 Samuel. Now you gotta go backwards again a little bit. Past Psalms, past Chronicles, past Kings to get to 2 Samuel as you go backwards. 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel 6. The context in 2 Samuel 6 is this. King David, most of you know of. King David has established his kingdom now in Jerusalem and it's a new place for the kingdom. That's where God has now allowed him to rule. He's been, he ruled for... Um, Seven years first in another place, and then he moved the kingdom to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem became now, from that time forward, the headquarters and the capital of the nation of Israel. And so David wants to move the ark, which has been stored temporarily, the 400-year-old ark that was built during the time of Moses and that represents the presence of God among the people. God, uh, David is very anxious to move that ark now to Jerusalem. And so he sends out a group, a party to do that. But as they're moving this ark, something happens. There's a lot of rejoicing going on. Everybody's anxious to get this done. But notice 2 Samuel 6 now and beginning in verse 6. It says, when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah, who's one of the guys moving the ark, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark and took hold of it for the oxen had stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah and God struck him down there because of his error. And he died there beside the ark of God. Now, first reading, doesn't that seem harsh? I mean, God kills this guy because he's trying to keep the ark of the covenant from falling off the cart? But before we sit in judgment of God, beloved, in our human pride, we would do well to ask a few questions. And the first question might be this. How did God instruct previously that the ark was supposed to be transported? And the answer is found in several places back in the early law in the book of Leviticus and then in the book of Exodus. God had instructed that the ark of the covenant was to be carried by poles. It was not to be put on ox carts. So he says, for example, in Exodus 25 verse 14, You shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark by them. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. Even when it was in the Holy of Holies, those poles stuck out. And they were the means by which the ark was to be carried. Furthermore, God had given instruction that only people from the tribe of Levi, people from the tribe of Levi, and specifically of the family of Kohath within the tribe of Levi, were to carry the ark and the tabernacle utensils. So who is Uzzah? Uzzah is from the tribe of Judah. These are going south a little bit, aren't they? Furthermore, even the Kohathites were never to touch the ark. Numbers 4 Verse 15 tells us that. In fact, God had decreed that if a Kohathite even glanced at the ark while it was in the Holy of Holies, in the middle of the tabernacle, they would die instantly. 
What's God doing? God is setting up, beloved, appreciation for his holiness that we don't come by naturally. And so he gives these instructions about how his presence represented by the ark is to be handled among the people. And he's basically saying you can't mess with God's holiness, not for very long. And here's Uzzah, wrong tribe, wrong family, wrong transportation, and now touching the glory of God. And God says enough. I'm going to make an example here. And Uzzah died. Uzzah's act, beloved, was not an act of heroism. It was an act of arrogance. It's the arrogance that comes upon us so subtly and so, you know, that we just don't, it sneaks up on us and we don't see it. His arrogance, in his arrogance, he assumed that his hand was less polluted than the land, or the ground that the ark was going to land on. See, but it wasn't the ground that would desecrate the ark. It was the touch of man that would desecrate. Listen, the ground obeys the commands of God, right? The ground brings forth its fruit in its season. It's, it's not in disobedience to God. It does what God tells it to do. The ground does not commit cosmic treason. Man does that. We are the ones who touch the glory. We are the ones who play God. We are the ones who are arrogant enough to think that we can break the laws of God when we don't like them because we understand better than God does. We're the ones who desecrate that which is holy. Every act of pride, every act of disobedience, every act of going my own way is nothing less than shaking my fist in the face of God and saying, I know better than you do. I'm better able to run my life than you are. I'm better able to account for my happiness than you are. And every single one of those acts, beloved, is subject to the same penalty that Uzzah paid. It's just that God graciously gives us time to repent, but the time doesn't go on forever. All sin is condemned, but pride tops the list. Pride tops the list. It's, you can't say that one sin is worse than another. You know, James reminds us if you break the law on one point, it's just like you broke the whole thing. But you can certainly say that pride is at the core of all sin. How much criticism could you have without pride? How much, you know, the arrogance that just comes, could you have without pride? How much discouragement could you have without pride? It should be going my way. How many grudges could we hold? How much anger could we have if we, if we weren't proud of our own and protective of our own rights and of our own person? Pride is at the root of all of it. Brings us to a fourth point, the first sin recognized. The first sin recognized because I can guarantee you, because I'm right here with you. We're sitting here this morning listening to this and we're saying, great, so God's going to judge pride. Go to it, Lord. Get those so-and-sos. Get those arrogant, you know, whatever. Get them. But we never look in the mirror. We're so much better at seeing the flaws of other people than we are at seeing our own, right? I used to have a friend college. And he loved to say, I can hardly wait for tomorrow because I get better looking every day. And I used to hear that and I thought, well, okay, he's kidding. And then after I'd heard it a few times, I thought, well, maybe, maybe he's more than just kidding, you know? And, and then I realized, you know, there were a lot of girls around who probably led him to believe that was really true. And there was an element at least of pride in the statement. And so we recognize pride when we see it, right? We recognize pride. We we, we see the pastor who says, hey, the church grew 100% last year. And what he doesn't tell them is that, you know, that it consisted of five people, two of, him, two of whom were him and his wife. Ooh, that's pride. We recognize that one. You know, the pride is the guy getting photographed. And he says, whoa, whoa, wait, 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 wait till I, you know, I want you to get my best side. And he really means it, right? And we, and we say, yeah, that's, boy, that's a proud guy. We see it and we know it. Pride, you know, pride is the victory dance of all those guys on television that you're going to watch this afternoon on those football games, right? When they make one good play, <laughs> one good play, 
And we look at them. And we say, how dumb. I, I, you know, I subscribe to the Vince Lombardi theory, right? When you get in the end zone and you get a touchdown, act like you've been there before. <laughs> but a modern day coach, is, you know, they, when, they, when, they, when the players are making more than they are, they can't really tell them that kind of stuff. We recognize pride when we see it, right? Mark Twain said, I've I've been complimented many times and they always embarrass me. I always feel they've not said enough. <laughs> we recognize pride, right? And it's surely not us. But of course it is. We all swim together. We all swim together in the first sin. We're all there together. And I'll tell you what, it's, it's alive and well in our churches. That's why the world looks at us and, say, and says, what a bunch of hypocrites. Because to a great extent, we are. You know, we, 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 have, we, we have our little games that we play. You know, these church games. You have, you have to be really careful when you play the church game. It's, it's the only game I know where if you, if you get caught, you lose, right? You, you, you can't get caught playing or you lose, but, but we have our games and we have our ways of exhibiting our pride. They're, they're kind of two basic ways of playing this game of pride in church. One is, one is I'm more spiritual than you are, and the other one is I'm beyond hope. Both of them, both of them are pride in disguise. You ever hear this? You know, this morning in my devotions, the Lord, the Lord taught me something that's really rich. Now, you know, I'll grant you, that can be said and really be meant, can be honestly and truly meant. But it's just as likely that what's behind the statement is this. I hope you understand. I have devotions every day. Every day, I never miss. And I hope you also understand God tells me rich things special things. I'm sorry you don't get them. It's just another way of saying I'm more spiritual than you are, right? How about this one? In my humble opinion, I cringe every time I hear that. Because, you know, and it's, it's, probably, it's probably my pride. But, but, you know, so many times what that really means is, and by the way, my humble opinion is better than you on your best day. But I couldn't very well say in my superior opinion or nobody would listen to me and it would look like I was arrogant, right? So it's in my humble opinion. I love it. The other day I was talking to Pastor Dave and he and I were talking about the leadership program which, which translated means when the pastor needs spiritual advice, he knows who to talk to. Isn't it great how he surrounds himself only with the best people? I'm more spiritual than you are. We have a thousand ways of doing this. Now I'm glad to say, love it, I don't, I don't hear this going on around here. But it scares me to death. It scares me to death far more for me than it does for you because this Pride sneaks up on us so easily. It just takes us over and we don't realize. Anytime we're looking down on somebody else, anytime we're thinking we're better than they are, anytime we think we've got it together in a way they don't, what is that? It's pride. And we do it all the time. Instead of seeing that if we are anything, it's only in Christ. And so there's no credit to us. I think, that, you know, I don't know if it's the more prominent version, but numbers-wise, it probably is. That's the version of pride that says I'm beyond hope. I'm beyond hope version. I don't have any spiritual gifts. Oh, really? God says you do? So who are you going to believe? Well, yeah, but I, I, I'm just not capable. Really? Have you ever tried? Have you put yourself out there to find out what God might do through you. You know what's the, the, at the base of those statements? I'm so, fear, I'm, so, so, I'm so inferior that even God can't fix me. That's a statement of pride. It's just pride in a, in a downward direction. Because it's not true. 
God is capable of using you. God has gifted you. God has gifted all of us. He may not use you because of the unbelief and the fear and the laziness that's represented in those statements, but I guarantee you the day will come when you will be responsible to him and give account to him when your God-playing days are over and when he's truly in charge. He's not fooled. He's not fooled. Well, how about the first sin defeated? How do we defeat this first sin? Well, the antidote to pride would be what? Humility? Humility? Humility would be it, right? Have you ever tried to be humble? Do you know how hard it is to be humble? Humility is hard to come by, right? Remember the old Mac Davis song? You probably, a few of you maybe could go back. The old Mac Davis song, Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. It's tough. And you know, kind of at the root of our heart is this ability to think that, you know, we may not have it perfect, but we're better than most. Kind of got it together. And the Bible is saying this, Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. Paul argues this way in Ephesians 1, 4, verses 1 and 2, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. So he's urging, remember this is the great hinge point in the book of Ephesians where we go from here's who you are and here's how you should act because this is who you are. You're a Christian, act like it. You're a McNeff, act like it. You're part of the family, act like it. And here's how you act like it. So he's going to go into this great practical section. And what is the absolute first thing he says? I therefore, a prisoner of God, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility. Number one. And then gentleness and patience and forbearance and all these other things. But number one, humility. Walk in humility. It's not hard to walk in humility when you're digging a trench outside, right? Or when you're moving the tables and chairs around or where you're changing diapers back in the nursery. Some tasks just kind of come with humility built in, right? But the more we're out front, the more we're doing something that we consider more important, the harder it is. Humility comes hard. Peter says in 1 Peter 5, verse 5, clothe yourselves, all of you, Oh, this would heal so many relationship issues in churches and among people. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility. Now listen to this. Here's why. Because God opposes the proud. God opposes the proud. Love, and we take on that, I'm going to play God and I'm going to, I'm, these people are wrong and I'm going to set them straight and this is the way it ought to be and we take this attitude and this pride is just coming oozing out of us. We've made ourselves the enemy of God at that point. Think about that. But God gives grace to the humble, so clothe yourselves in humility, put it on like a garment, wrap yourselves in it, be willing to give away a few rights in order to be humble. Zechariah 2 3 says it really simple. It just says, seek humility. But how do you do that? Humility is elusive, isn't it? It's like trying to pick up a bar of soap. The more you squeeze it, the more it pops out, right? The more you think you've achieved humility, the more you haven't, right? I've been working on humility lately, and I think I'm there. What does that tell you? Probably not quite. So how do you do this? Three things. These are very practical. We can all do them. We all need them on a daily basis. Number one, confess our pride. Confess our pride. We need to do this almost constantly because this wells up in us constantly. The more we confess it, the more we will see it for what it is, the more we will abhor it. 
as God abhors it, but when we don't confess it, we just let it go on and it continues, it begins to eat away and eat away and eat away until it just, it just, it just dominates our life and we don't even see it anymore. So we need to confess it. The moment you see it popping up, even just a little bit, and it pops up all the time, right? Home is the place to start. How could my wife or husband be so dumb as to ask to do this or my child be so dumb as to do this? And we're looking down on somebody and that means pride is rearing its ugly head. We need to confess it. Listen to this quote by C.S. Lewis. He says, if anyone would like to acquire humility, I can, I think, tell him the first step. The first step is to realize that one is proud. And a biggish step too. At least nothing whatsoever can be done before it. If you think that you are not conceited, it means that you are very conceited Indeed. True, isn't it? So we need to confess it. We need to get it out. We need to, before the Lord, acknowledge that this is the kind of person that we are. Constantly seeking to be our own God, constantly seeking to lord it over others, constantly seeing ways to... I, beloved, we, we do this in so many ways. We, we look at ourselves as superior. I hear people all the time, you know, railing against homosexuals. Listen, are homosexuals living in a, in, in a sinful lifestyle according to the Bible? Absolutely. Does that make me superior? Absolutely not. And my pride comes out when the only reason that I may not have that orientation is what? Is because of the way God created me. But guess what? I'm equally sinful just in some other way. It doesn't mean we don't stand against the evil. We do. But we got to do it from an attitude of humility and recognizing, whoa, where am I wrong? Do you see? We're all sinful in this way. Secondly, so we confess it. Secondly, put others before ourselves. Pride stems from having and paying an inordinate amount of attention to myself, to my needs, my desires, my goals my things. So one of the greatest exercises we can have is to begin to think about others more than we think about ourselves. And no better place to start than at home, right? And when, you know, when was the last time you really thought about what something you could do for your husband or wife other than something that was going to give you points, right? And if you guys from Robert Lewis' study, remember, you know, you only, you, don't, you only get one point for going to Y and one point for bringing flowers. So, you know, the points aren't really the issue. Remember that? The issue is to, from the heart, do something for somebody else that takes your mind and attention off yourself. What is the, what is the, what is the requirement? Jesus says, how's the law summarized? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. There's nothing in there about taking care of me, right? It's about others. So a second way that we can dissipate pride in our life is to focus, turn the focus outward. Pride dissipates when the focus turns outward. This takes discipline. It doesn't come naturally. You have to think about this. But the Lord commands it. He says in Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only on his own interests, but also on in the interests of others. He doesn't say don't look on your own interests, but he says look more on the interests of others. Care about them. Spend time on their needs. Starve pride out. It's one of the ways to starve it out. Go find a way to do something for others that you wouldn't normally think about. Thirdly, remember that our value comes from being in Christ. Our value comes from being in Christ. You see these statement after statement after statement from you know, unbelieving philosophers about the meaninglessness of life. And guess what? They're absolutely right. Apart from Christ and apart from the God who created us, life is meaningless. 
But in Christ, it takes on all the meaning in the world because now we're glorifying the one who created us. We're giving to him the praise by the way that we live. And so in Christ, we have value. To seek humility doesn't mean to say, well, I'm just a worm, I'm worthless, I'm no good. No, that's not what it means. To seek humility means to say that I derive my worth from my relationship with Jesus. I derive my worth from being part of the family of God. I derive my worth from the forgiveness that Jesus has brought into my life. Satan thought he had worth in himself. He saw the beauty that God had given him and he got mixed up. He thought he was responsible for that. He saw the splendor that God had given him and he got mixed up. He thought he was responsible for that. And so he thought he could set himself above God. He took upon himself prerogatives that didn't belong to him. Had he kept all of that in perspective, the whole history of the universe would have been different. Instead, he saw himself as something apart from God. Paul makes a telling statement. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 4, listen to this. He says, what do you have that you did not receive? If then you have received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? When we see everything that we have, everything that we are, everything that we hope to be is coming from God himself, the first sin is defeated. When I see my car, my house, my wife, my failures, my successes, my everything came from God, pride begins to be defeated. When I realize that I'm nothing without him, but I'm a child of the king in him, now I'm attached to reality. The other way, I'm living in a fantasy world. In other words, another way to say this, beloved, is when we make Christ our greatest treasure, when he becomes our treasure, and we stop thinking about me and number one and all my plans and ambitions, and it becomes about him and his agenda and his plans and his ambitions for me, it changes everything. Pride goes the way of all things, and I've treasured him. Let me close with this. A stockbroker had made millions of dollars for this uh, Arab Arabian oil sheik. And so this, this guy, wanted, he, wanted, he wanted to do something for him. He offered him many valuable gifts, but the stockbroker kept saying, no, 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 no. I, I, this is my job. This is what I do. I don't, I don't want anything. But he kept pressing and he kept persisting. And so the guy finally said, well, okay. He said, I'll tell you what, I, I just took up golf. A new set of golf clubs would be, would be nice. A few weeks went by, he hadn't heard anything. And then he got a letter, like a letter from the sheik. And the sheik said this, it said, so far ha I have bought you three golf clubs. And the guy's thinking, I wonder which three they were, wood, whatever. The letter went on. I hope you will not be disappointed, but only two of them have swimming pools. I plan that the rest will be fully equipped. <laughs> that was a gift he wasn't anticipating, right? Way beyond anything he could envision. Now listen, here's the application. Love it. In our pride, in our pride, at the end of the day, we get nothing. Despite what we think we're going to achieve. But when we see ourselves in Christ, when we humbly treasure him instead of us, we get way more than we could ever imagine. Treasure ourselves and get nothing. Treasure him and get everything. Let's treasure him. Let's pray. Father, this is, uh, this is easy to talk about. It, it, is, it is really hard to do. I don't know if because the first sin was the first sin, it's just kind of built into us that it's the, it's the hardest thing to attack, it's the hardest thing to see, it sneaks up on us, we don't even see it. The more, the, more, the more we practice it, the less we see it. The more we confess it, the more we can finally begin to see it. Lord, help us, help us to not just see it, but to defeat it. Help us to confess it, help us to focus, begin to focus on others more than we do. But most of all, help us to make you preeminent in our lives. Help us to treasure you so that whether you give us good or bad, whether it's, whether it's abundance or whether it's just, so we can just say like Paul, you know, I know how to live in abundance. I know how to live with nothing. It doesn't matter. All that matters is Christ. 
then we've gotten to the right place. And the pride that so easily takes us over will be defeated. And I pray that it will be for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.